where she transformed a struggling Sunville neighborhood into a nationally recognized hub for innovation, unique food businesses, and creative community events. She founded the annual celebration of Marshmallow Fluff titled What the Fluff, who has been the What the Fluff. Guys, you can't miss this. It's so great. It's every September. Um, and you're, you're going to let go, especially after you read her book, Fluff, the sticky sweet story of an American icon. We're so pleased to have Mimi here tonight. She currently works for the city of Chelsea, but has much to add on what's happening in Kendall Square. She's going to introduce our other speakers. So please join me in welcoming our moderator, Mimi Craney. Street, which was a, a movie theater dedicated to offbeat films and animation. Um, and I remember at that time um, there was conversations about Kendall Square's up and coming and they're going to want a movie theater and um, off the wall cinema thought it might have been in the running. There was a tiny little storefront movie theater. Um, and at the time we couldn't envision um, any uh, bright future for the neighborhood and it's uh, really dramatic on how it's changed um, to today. Um, so I'm going to first turn to Deborah Morse, who's our first um, person we're going to have a conversation with. Deborah Morse is a lifelong Cambridge resident. She's a community activist, and she's president of Newtown Court, Washington Elms Tenant Council, and she's secretary of the Francis O'Brien Mentorship Program. She's currently attending Harvard University's Extension Program. The specific neighborhood Newtown Court is a part of the city known as Area 4, which you're probably familiar with. It's one-third of a square mile running west from the train tracks in Kendall Square to Prospect Street in Central Square. And this neighborhood, in some way, um, perfectly reflects the disparities in Cambridge. It's the home of nearly, nearly 7,000 people, and many of them among the poorest in the city. And if you were to slice Kendall Square into pie-shaped pieces with the Charles River kind of running up and down, um, and were to do a, a slice, creating a triangle south on Broadway, towards MIT, a third middle slice just to the north of Broadway towards Central Square, and then a triangle further north towards Lechmere. If you look at those three pie-shaped uh, pieces, the changes are really dramatic. Um, in that middle area, a third of the residents are below the poverty line. And just what is the poverty line? That's a little over $20,000 a year for a family of three. And that middle slice shows a major racial division, too. The top and bottom slices have left less than 2% of the residents identified as black. In that middle section, black residents make up 40%. And this neighborhood has more uh, children than any other Cambridge area, too. A key to the disparity, disparity clearly um, lies in housing. According to Zillow today, the median rent in Cambridge is $2,900 a month. Some folks might say, jump on that apartment, and it's a deal. Um, digging into data on uh, citydata.com, looking at those three pie slices again, the median uh, that residents are out of pocket for rent in the top and bottom slices is about $2,000 a month, while thanks to subsidized housing in the middle slice, the median is $600 a month. Mm -hmm. So Deborah, um, so hearing that about the disparities in these three pie slices, and as somebody who's lived in the neighborhood, does that ring true to your experience? Um, and do you feel um, that, you, that the, those racial disparities and economic di disparities are visible um, to both you and is it visible to art? When you say the triangles, I'm not clear exactly what you mean by that. What are you talking about as far as the diversity and the ethnic backgrounds of the majority of the people who live in the neighborhood? Yes, yeah, so if you were to take um, sort of Broadway to Cambridge Street, um, and think of that as a little triangle air shaped area. Um, and then if you were to think of south of Broadway, to the MIT neighborhood, and then versus each area area, um, or in East Cambridge. So if you think of those as three different sort of neighborhoods that kind of make up the edges of Kendall Square, um, that middle section of area four is dramatically different than the other two areas. So the majority of the people that live in that area are um, mostly from Haiti. India, uh, a lot of the different Latino countries, and there's a very small percentage that are actually African American. That's absolutely correct. So, in terms of th 
thinking about where you shop and where you spend your, your time. Um, so you live in that sort of middle section. Um, do you feel drawn more to Central Square or to Kendall Square? Where is sort of the place where you spend more of your time? Actually, I do a lot of my shopping in Boston. Um, also shopping, I usually could go to some uh, if you're looking for groceries, the only shopping, not the only shopping place, but you have the stock markets, you have the Whole Foods, you have the um, Harvest, and those places are very expensive. So someone who lives in my neighborhood, those uh, stores are not convenient for um, what they are budget. We can't afford the shopping places like that. So we're forced to go outside of Cambridge to go shopping. Do you think your neighborhood um, and the people that are there, are they, are, they, um, are they visible to the rest of the community in Kendall Square? Absolutely not. It did, we call it the blind wall. It separates Kendall Square from, actually, if you go along um, Portland Street, that we call it the blind wall because that's where the housing development begins. So you have housing development on one side of the street and if you look down you see the glamour and the lights and the glitter of Kendall Square where we don't fit. We just don't fit there. Okay, so I'm going to move on to our next panelist. Um, David Sung Kong, Kong is a synthetic biologist and a community organizer. He's the director of MIT Media Lab's new Community Bi Biotechnology Initiative and is the leader of the global biohacking movement. He's a co-founder and faculty of How to Grow Almost Anything, an international distributed course on biotechnology. He's the founder and director of EMU, East Meets West Bookstore, an art technology and community nonprofit space on Mass Ave near the Planet Stars by Stop. <laughs> the mission of EMW Bookstore is to create a community-oriented space and resource for people from marginalized identities to explore their creative visions. He's performed as a DJ, beatboxer, vocalist, and rapper at hundreds of venues. His photography has been exhibited at the Smithsonian and other museums and galleries across the country. Now, on the website for the Community Biotechnology Initiative, David directs that David directs read, humanity's capacity to engineer the living world is a collective concern that requires collective engagement. The Community Biotechnology Initiative is developing tools and technologies to enable the broadest possible participation in biotechnology. So I've been thinking, David, about the two hats that you wear, one at the EMW Bookstore and the other at the Community Biotechnology Initiative. And I see there are strong commonalities. There's empowerment, engaging marginalized communities, collaboration, and I also see a real contrast. Your works at EMU happens inside a small old building on a still somewhat scrappy stretch of Mass Ave. It's the work of a group of like-minded friends, um, and the funding is probably relatively modest. Um, Compare that to the work that you're doing at MIT, um, it takes part, it takes place in a big, slick new building at MIT. It's well endowed within a major institution. And your work there is a little less accessible. I could just walk by EMW and peek through the, um, the street window um, and uh, I've only had one visit to the media lab. Um, and when I look at the, um, your uh, website for the collaborative, I read about fluid, um, metafluidics.org, which is called the Pinterest of Microfluidics, and where you share designs of on a chip devices, lab on a chip devices, which I have to Google many uh, phrases, but just within the one sentence. So I'm interested in hearing a little bit about how you navigate those two neighborhoods and two ways of being still while having the same um, drive for building community and collaboration and innovation um, and how you might need to change your approach in each one and um, some of the differences and commonalities you see between them. Uh, thanks so much for the question and thanks so much for uh, all the organizers for making this wonderful event happen. It's a real, real pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, so so it's interesting. I think uh, we were chatting a little bit earlier. You know, EMW Bookstore, East Coast Bookstore. It's uh, it's a space that used to be uh, Hubba Hubba. I don't know if you all know Hubba Hubba or it's a bookstore yet. So um, you know, my parents they bought that building in the late nineties um, and they turned it into a Chinese language bookstore called East Meets West Bookstore. So the neighbors were like very excited that the sex toy shop was moving out and like the Chinese academics were moving in. <laughs> so, uh, 
And then, um, you know, in the mid-2000s, uh, myself and a number of other community organizers uh, turned the space into a community space. We started organizing open mics, primarily for the Asian American community in the greater Boston area. But the spirit kind of stayed the same because, you know, my parents, they were you know, Chinese, you know, immigrants from China, and they were really interested in, you know, creating a community space for their generation of Chinese immigrants. And so, you know, and I, I thought the points that you were making earlier about kind of these unseen parts of Kendall Square, you know, Specifically at EMW, like our mission is all about serving underrepresented groups, marginalized communities. Because, you know, I think, I think, you know, particularly for the Asian American uh, experience, you know, growing up here in the U.S., you know, you don't see a lot of yourself reflected in mainstream media, narrative, storytelling, and so you know, our space kind of uh, served as a as a platform and a venue for uh, for folks that don't normally have their stories told, uh, so that you know, you have your own microphone, you've got your space where you can express yourself and share something really authentic and vulnerable and from the heart. And um, you know, we first started organizing our open mics there called East Meets Words, that was in 2005. And so we're having our, our 12 year anniversary, or 13 year anniversary, I guess, coming up this morning, which is, which is pretty amazing. And so uh, over the past you know, five or so years, we expanded the programming from just poetry to include like, electronic music, um, we have a gallery, we have a community library, and so on. And then we started building out this uh, community biology lab. So, there's this, so kind of, you know, and, and that's where it intersects over with the Media Lab. So the Media Lab is a very interesting place that explores creativity primarily through the lens of art, science, engineering, and design. So there's a kind of the four quadrants that the Media Lab explores. And EMW is almost like a little weird mini, mini Media Lab, but in Central Square, which you near know, to your point is a lot grittier, it's a lot more um, kind of right there on the street. And, um, and so, you know, I would say the spirit of both of those spaces is totally the same. Like, my heart and all of it is ultimately about, you know, how do we get these communities engaged and empowered and feeling like they have a voice. And right now, you know, for those of you that are maybe not aware, you know, biotech, uh, you know, it's this major technological revolution. I'm sure, you know, we'll hear a little bit more about it, um, you know, uh, as well from our other team panelists. Uh, but uh, but I think I think um, you know one thing that's happening now is you know biotech traditionally has been sort of a domain for you know, kind of the elites right it's for the MITs the Harvards um, you know for uh, the corporate entities or the government labs that have access to this technology and increasingly you know over the past five or six years again there's this kind of broader movement called do it yourself biology or community biotech biology or biohacking actually the very first do it yourself biology meetup happened in Cambridge. So it's a global movement now, but the very first meetup happened at the Asgard, which is, I guess, officially Times Square. Um, and so that happened in 2008, I think it started as a meetup, and now there are you know, labs all around the world, hundreds of people labs around the world. And, and just like three weeks ago, um, you know, through the initiative of the Media Lab, we hosted uh, the first ever global gathering of the entire global network of these laboratories. So we had people from you know, Africa, New Zealand, Australia, Singapore, all throughout Asia, Latin America, et cetera, all came to the, all came to the media lab for this event. So, so I, I think it's, a, it's this interesting thing where like Cambridge, and particularly Kendall Square, has this kind of local presence, but also like a global impact. Um, and I think for me, you know, the heart of all of that work, whether it's at EMW in Central Square, or at the media lab, or kind of connecting with these global communities, is thinking about, you know, how do we take the privilege of places like MIT and, and you know, probably like Cambridge, and um, you know, ultimately try to get uh, many communities that aren't normally at the table involved. But picking from what you just sort of said about the kind of global environment, is there a way in which uh, the work in Kendall Square has a global audience, and your work in at EMW is uh, a neighborhood audience? Is that? Yeah, a I, I, I think that's a fair, a fair, fair statement. Um, yeah, I mean, I think EMW definitely we really focus focus very, very much on the local, uh, you know, communities in Cambridge, but very Boston area. Too. I think a lot of people make the track to come to at uh, EMW. Actually, throughout the East Coast, I would say too, in general, for some of our programs. Um, but, but Kendall and, and definitely MIT Broadly, of course, you know, really is a good global, global outreach. And I think, you know, in my you know kind of particular space, which is for our biotech, uh, there are a number of really major institutions that, that um, I think have this kind of presence in Kendall but have a global reach. Uh, one that I mentioned to you earlier when we were chatting, it's um, called the International Genetic and Engineered Machines Competition, or IGEM. Um, IGEM is now, this, it's one of the major educational institutions in uh, biotechnology in the world. Um, it's basically kind of like a giant science fair for bio nerds. So what happens is um, there's a, uh, you know, there, there are I think around 5,000, almost 6,000 students that are undergraduates <coughs> that uh, compete from all around the world, 460 countries, and um, they, they basically build these genetically engineered machines 
uh, over the course of the summer, and then they come to Boston, the Heinz Convention Center, and then they share all of their, their work at this like, major, major global event. So I'm the official DJ for that event. That's probably my, my most important role that I have. Uh, but yeah, but definitely I think there is a global perspective. Right. So our next panelist is uh, Robin Shepard. Um, he's a historian of biology and medicine at the MIT program in science, technology, and society. He studies the history of the bio, uh, biological and biomedical sciences in American society, and he currently focuses on the history of the, bio, of the biotechnology industry. Previously, he was a visiting scholar at the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. His first book, A Contagious Cause, A Search for Cancer Viruses and the Growth of American Biomedicine, will appear in, in, in 2018. He recently edited a special issue of studies in the history of biomedicine, uh, sorry, in the history and philosophy of the biological and biomedical sciences that focuses on the history of cancer viruses. I checked out the highlights of the various articles in the publication and I found some handholds for a humanities oriented person like me. One article explores the organism as a metaphysical and empirical concept. Another explores the met metaphors used to understand the death of a cell. His current project focuses on the history of biotechnology in the Boston area. So the overall theme of Robin's work is understanding the mutual influence of science on society and of society on science. So Robin is a historian and is somebody who's looking at this interplay. We have a whole range of lenses to think about Kendall Square both across time and is part of the larger ecosystem of Cambridge, Greater Boston, and the world. So what are some of the lenses that are primary for you and some of the ones that you might suggest for us to think uh, yeah, uh, thank you very much, and I'm, just, I'm thrilled to be here to talk about this in the, in the belly of the beast, uh, as it were. Uh, so I, I sort of came into this interest uh, because I started off in chemistry. I'm a science nerd. I think science is amazing, uh, and I think there's a lot of power in it. But the more that I read and I thought about science, I also was trying to make sense of uh, walking around where I grew up in Berkeley or walking around uh, my college campus, and all the buildings that were being built friends in chemistry class were talking about medical school and biotechnology startups. I said, well, how does this, how does this all fit together? And I started looking at uh, various groups of biologists during the 19, uh, during the 1930s, actually, a time of great sort of turmoil, asking this question of how can science be used to serve social ends? And what does it mean to sort of look at science and society uh, in the same frame? I was a chemistry major at that point. I thought it was very bizarre. Because uh, I thought the science is something you did in the lab, and it had its own standards of truth, it was objective, and that it couldn't be argued with by somebody who was sort of standing outside in that laboratory. I, but what I, I came to realize, of course, and this is what a lot, a lot of my, uh, my initial historical work is, is that looking at how science is done actually brings you out to society, forces you to think about that world outside the laboratory and what it means. And that's sort of the, uh, the prelude to the, the big question that I'm interested in, as, as you mentioned, which is this relationship between science and society, and very importantly, how the science that we do is used to serve the society that we want, and not the other way around. And so a lot of the stuff I do is sort of in that spirit, and I try to think about ways that uh, scientific work relates to the modern world. So a few of those lenses that I use in particular, I'm a really big fan of uh, urban history and geographic history, looking at where things happen. Uh, so for example, I find it really interesting that the biotech industry in Kendall uh, has arisen in Kendall and it hasn't gone to the suburbs, which is sort of anomalous from the perspective of the history of the computing industry. Uh, I think a lot about uh, economics. I think about what does it mean to have an economy based on innovation versus an economy based on manufacturing and what types of factors in terms of law and policy make that possible. Uh, I guess the final thing I'll say is I think a lot about what that means to individual people. Uh, what does that mean to somebody walking by the new building that's being built? What does it take for somebody to go into a lab and pipette for 12 hours a day and then sleep under their bed with their experiment uh, and is running overnight? What types of stories do people tell themselves at that level to make sense of the world that they're living in and how can we sort of excavate those stories? Because the, the thing I, I think, I guess the practical idea of doing all this history is very often the story that one person tells themselves about where they came from in their history leaves out a lot of stuff. And that's often very important stuff if you have people in power making decisions based on an incomplete history, they can often do things that don't sort of take that relationship between science and society in the direction that makes it beneficial. Now that we've learned a little bit about the three of our panelists, I want to learn a little bit about who's here. 
So if folks can raise their hand, how many people here live in Cambridge? How many have lived here for more than a year? More than five years? More than 20 years? More than 30 years? Wow, so long time since. Um, how many people work in Cambridge? How many people work in Kendall Square? How many people have, I think we might have said, uh, how many people have been at the Google Center here before? How many people over the age of 18 have punched a time clock for their job? And how many people like Echo Quakers, or should they become a relevant history? <laughs> Yeah, there was a yes or no. Oh, yes. Relic of history. <laughs> so I um, want to sort of have us have a little bit of a conversation, thinking about Kendall Square, going back to uh, what you had said, Deborah, about sort of the, the wall from your neighborhood. Um, and I've been thinking about the sort of um, invisible walls. A lot of people talk about how it can be really impermeable to know what's happening in the buildings around here. Um, a lot of folks have never been inside a bio lab or biotech lab don't have any idea of what happens there, don't know who are the companies that are active here. Um, uh, don't, uh, I'm also aware of the, there can be ways in which it can look like public space, so we can have a, um, a green in front of a building, but it looks like a public park, but it's actually a corporate owned space, and there's subtle ways in which people can feel invited or not invited. Um, the plazas can look like public space, but they're still sort of corporate owned. The role that the, um, the university and the corporations have played in, in developing a space that is stewards of a, um, of a neighborhood, but um, without necessarily the, with a different sometimes set of motivations. Um, so I've been thinking a little bit about what it means to be a campus in that context. So thinking about Kendall Square being an extension of the MIT campus, and in some ways being a, a corporate campus, um, and thinking how more and more I'm seeing senior centers and, and, um, and colleges and schools existing on campuses, and what are the good things about uh, having a campus? Being a sense of like-minded folks with a sense of purpose, or a common purpose, uh, a sort of sense of shelter, um, so to be able to nurture that exploration, and sometimes in a, what can be a vulnerable way, thinking about for innovation, it requires failure, and, um, and a synergy among um, that experience. Um, and there's lots of ways we can kind of explore the, the positive things about campus. But well, then there could be negative experiences where it can be very exclusive and isolating um, and can uh, become very impermeable um, and can have a, set up a, a conflict with the nearby neighborhoods. Um, so thinking a little bit about that idea about like walls and campuses and the, the positive and negative, I'm wondering what some of your thoughts might be on that. <clears throat> As I had mentioned in the information that I submitted, so my family's been in the city for well over 100 years. As a young girl, I grew up on Western Avenue. And at that time, I spent an awful lot of time inside the Harvard Yards. Harvard University held programs every day during the summertime for community kids. When I attended Cambridge High in Latin, I worked at the Department of Transportation in Kendall Square through a work studies program. And at that particular time, the universities and the Department of Transportation were a lot more friendly. They reached out to the surrounding communities that offered programs for the inner, kids, the inner city kids. And I'm not talking about just minority children. I'm talking about the children in the city of Cambridge. Those kinds of programs exist no more. And my feeling is that progress is fine. I believe that most of the cures to a lot of the diseases today will come out of Kendall Square, but when it comes at the expense of displacing families, black and white, who have lived in the city for generations, it's not right. So earlier in your life, you saw the campus and, and the university. I, the spent, role of I spent every summer inside the Harvard Yard as a young girl. They had programs for the inner city kids that lived throughout the city of Cambridge. And those programs don't exist anymore. And my family said, we can exist side by side. Uh, I don't understand why you would have 
the wealth that you have with this invisible wall? Why can't there be a partnership? Those, these corporations and entities in Kindle Square, it wouldn't hurt for them to reach out to the city of Kindle Square Department, offer some programs for some of these kids, have trainings for some of these children. Those types of things don't exist. And they should. They, it's, it's a wealthy community. The city of Boston and Cambridge was just recently ranked the sixth wealthiest city in America. There was no excuse for them not to give back and to share with the city, with the citizens of the city, especially those that were in the more under, not underdeveloped, but you know, the depressed areas in the city. Um, yeah, so I really appreciate your comments, and I, I think uh, you know, a lot of my personal interest in my career now is specifically about, you know, when, and particularly in a place like Cambridge where you go and you see the giant, the giant glass shiny building, and I think for the average resident walking down the street, you know, you know sense of what types of machines are in there, what the research is, what's being worked on, what the agenda is. And, um, you know, I think particularly for, you know, for a technology like biotech, which is such a focus of what's happening in Cambridge now, um, you know, I think part of what, what is interesting is you know, at EMW, in our particular space, right, we have this, this community laboratory. There's another uh, lab in the Boston area as well called uh, Boss Lab, uh, which is the Boston Human Science Lab. It's actually based in Somerville. And so kind of the mission of these spaces, in a way, is to try to uh, bridge that, that interface with the public so that, you know, if you want to learn about biotech, you can come to our lab, you can come to the Boss Lab, and you can take, like, a, you know, a, an intro to a molecular bio -like workshop and actually do some hands-on stuff and start learning about what's happening in biotech. Um, which, which again, you know, institutions like at MIT and Harvard and so on, they do, it's not like they're, they, there are no activities, there are definitely are activities, but I think it's an interesting um, kind of question of, you know, what's the role and how do we create the types of institutions that can better kind of bridge the public with a lot of this kind of major technological change that's happening. And actually one thing, uh, you know, Deborah, just, just so you know as well, um, one thing I was learning about, because there's this kind of broader community lab movement that's been taking place over the past, um, you know, eight, nine years or so, um, but actually a lot of the, the uh, major uh, biotech corporations in the area actually do have community laboratories. So, uh, for example, Novartis, uh, Biogen, they actually have community labs that are built out specifically for outreach to uh, local Cambridge and other uh, kind of communities. So, and Biogen's lab, I think, has been around for more than 10 years or so, and so they actually actively work closely with uh, public school systems and have the kids come in, do free summer programming, and so on. So, um, there's definitely um, programs that exist. I actually just learned about them recently myself, and was pretty, pretty surprised. It was funny too because I think the, the folks that are part of the, um, the community labs that are connected with these these large pharmaceutical and biotech companies, you know, they weren't aware that there's this other kind of movement around community biotechnology as well. So I think there's a lot of just everybody trying to understand, um, you know, what kind of programs exist and how do we all interlink and federate and better support each other. Because um, I think you know there's there's so many people that really really want to see that that bridge. And those walls kind of come down more. We just gotta kind of find each other and work to work harder to make it happen. Uh, yeah, I think it's an absolutely critical point that you make about the boundaries that can exist between, especially academic institutions and the communities around them. And it's something that's, I mean, as a historian, I can say that's not necessarily, yeah, as, as your pretty experience, it's not the way it always was. And one of the things that has happened, especially around biotechnology and biomedicine, is uh, I have one graph I sent in, but over the last 40 years or so, uh, you know, spending on space is sort of like flatlined or stayed the same or increased but gradually. Spending on uh, physics is either flatlined or declined slightly. And the one area that sort of continues to sort of go upwards, uh, not quite exponentially, but close, is uh, federal funding for biomedical research, which means that all the, you know, a lot of this growth and a lot of the expansion is based around uh, medicine and health. Uh, and that's sort of the one of the stable economic anchors of these cities, which means they'll sort of have that type of research intensifying as the economic base of the town can, you know, can hurt. And so the, the disparities sort of become that much greater, and sort of these boundaries can become really drawn out. And then the, the question that looking forward is, you know, how do you create pathways forward for people around that sort of that center to sort of see themselves in that center? And that's sort of one of the things that, you know, manufacturing jobs are, you know, they're they're problematic in other ways, but the idea of having a path forward, you know, the, the program of apprenticeships, having you know, you know, organizations that can provide training, uh, having vocational training that is appropriate for the jobs. And I think that we have yet to see that infrastructure in part because the number of people required to do the research is maybe a lesser number. Uh, 
but also because the type of training required for it is such a long investment. And so balancing those those things is a really important thing for neighbors looking forward, I think. I think for me, one of the challenges is about building relationships. Um, and while there are some significant disparities and there, there's a role for the uh, businesses and um, the university that's here at Kendall Square to have a very service oriented and think of themselves as um, uh, sort of rebalancing that a little bit. I also feel like just in the, um, uh, a basic way about how to build those person-to-person -person relationships. Um, and one of the things I get concerned about is like when I see the cafe here in the office, uh, here in Google, that why not go downstairs to a neighborhood-owned cafe? Which I know it's like, oh, you have to go outside into the weather. But that sense of having friction with other people that are in the neighborhood and it being an economic generator. Um, I think back when I was, uh, I worked at Somerville Community Access Television, which is in the big firehouse in the middle of Union Square, and we did a renovation there. At the time, I was you know, really thinking a little bit about how to make the inside of the building work really well. Um, and it ended up turning completely interior. Um, and it didn't make it permeable for people to see what was happening there and to be a welcoming space. It worked really well once you were inside. Um, but not in terms of thinking about its role in the bigger neighborhood. And I sort of see that part of one of the challenges in this neighborhood, that there's not a way of building a person-to-person -person daily, um, the sort of repeat play concept that, uh, um, that Robert Putnam talks about, about building civic society. Um, and if we've got, um, I also think of like the, the lawn here at Google that, um, that used to be public open space and then Google took over a slice of it. So if, now when I go out there to, to an event, it's like, oh, there's the, the door I can't get through. So that sense of, of isolation. Um, so how, what are some of the ways that we can sort of build that person-to-person -person relationship? Sort of what you're doing at East Meets West Bookstore, where I can just pop in and, and um, you know, check out a book or rent the space. Are there ways in which uh, to build that type of community building here at Kendall Square to break down the invisible walls? <laughs> I, from sort of wearing my urban, my urban history, I, I'm finding happy. One of the main times to have those discussions in many ways is during Big Disca, I, you know, I, you know, my proposals for development, uh, zoning is one of the things that the city really has a lot of leverage uh, on. And that, the reason, the way that telescopes to your question, is many, you know, the buildings that are being built around Kendall Square now are, you know, they're laboratory and office space. <laughs> real estate is expensive and somebody left to their own devices will build a building that maximizes that payoff and they'll build a building that's good for the company inside. But a company like Google, like many other companies, wants to create an immersive experience for its employees. Like the more time that they're sort of at their desks, the better it is for, for Google as they see it. So like bringing services to them is a really good thing at that stage to do and that's what they'll do if they're sort of thinking along that axis. Uh, and it's reasonable for them to think of that way. But from a city perspective, one of the discussions is what happens at the street level. You know, what's valuable? Is there a need to install, you know, retail and commercial space? And how, on what terms is that uh, being current? This was already, this has happened already in Cambridge, as some of you might know. If you walk uh, down Main Street past the uh, Koch Institute for the history of uh, cancer research or the Broad Institute, where they do a lot of genomic sequencing, they have these open lobbies that are sort of intended to get at, to get at this question of how you sort of have some type of street level friction between people who are in the buildings and the people who are just walking by. To what degree it succeeded, I don't I, people in this room might have more opinions about that than, uh, than I know, but that's sort of a, one of those points. That was a, a, a result of a discussion about land use and zoning with that sort of thing in mind. Yeah, just to piggyback on that, um, yeah, that specific pitch point of using zoning, I've, I've heard you know, city council as well has explicitly expressed um, that that is a great way to uh, through that process that's one that's one point where uh, a lot of the corporations that come through will have to you know kind of think about uh, uh, kind of specifically setting up either space or program or whatever for the community through that mechanism so so definitely agree with that um, but I think also just in general you know there's there's a lot of creativity and a lot of really uh, interesting folks that are doing programming in these areas so you know it's it's a really really great question I think it's something that you know I hope for folks in the room you know we can all think about together because um, 
you know, I, I know, for example, I mean, these are some projects that came out of uh, MIT in uh, an architecture program. Um, I, I had two students uh, talk to me just a couple of months ago specifically about the idea of how do you kind of invigorate uh, spaces that may be sort of like corporate lobbies that are just kind of empty and don't have a lot of stuff going on there, and how do you ultimately connect those spaces with, for example, local artists and local community folks that are interested in programming and kind of bringing some vibrancy to those spaces, and could you set up some kind of interface so that, you know, those those entities and uh, kind of folks in the public sphere can kind of engage and then, and then share. And so there's, there's a lot of kind of interesting ideas like that, and again, you know, you know, at EMW, you know, we do a lot of that type of community work, and there are lots of organizations in Cambridge and, and around that um, are, are interested in that. But I think how to do it in a, in a really powerful way at scale is a, is a bigger question, and how to get the resources for that, how to make sure that there's budgets to support those that type of programming. Um, those are harder questions. Um, and again, I think, I think, you know, a lot of the, the corporations that are here, you know, they, they have philanthropic arms, they're interested in giving and supporting, um, but it's, it's a good question of how do you kind of you know, turn it into something that, you know, where there's more leverage to really ensure that uh, some of that capital goes towards supporting these types of efforts. Um, you know, very curious what other people in the room might, might think on that question as well, because I think we definitely need more of it. I'm really not certain exactly how you would go about trying to bridge the gap. Um, I, I think it would be a good idea to start with the Kendo Square Association for them to reach out to uh, maybe the Cambridge School Committee members or the Cambridge City Council members to try to get together to try to work something out, to try to bridge some of the gaps. I don't know exactly what they can do or how it should be done, but I think that's a start. I think we're going to open it up for a community conversation. We're going to see if we need a mic, um, but we're going to try without one. So, Ron. Thank you. Uh, Whitley, your, your comment at the very beginning about the municipal law in the state of the environmental workers. I think that in addition to the physical infrastructure that you guys have been talking about, there's a social infrastructure that really needs attention. And that basically means getting out of these buildings and going to area four and walking the streets and sitting and talking and creating some kind of a glue. I say, uh, that, that alerts the folks who are there that there's something else going on. And maybe there's an opportunity, maybe there's not, but at least provide uh, a possibility. But however you're going to fancy up Google or fancy up Coke or whatever it is, that doesn't matter. What does matter is what is going on in there and how do you find out about it. Did everybody hear that? Did, does the question need to be repeated or did everybody hear that? Let's want uh, Ron's comment repeated, or did enough people raise your hand if you want to hear it repeated? Okay. Um, there was a woman in the back there. I spend more time in Harvard Square and Central Square than I do in Kendall Square. I actually, when we got on the subway, my husband said, where do, where do we stand on the platform? I said, I have no idea. I never get off the subway in Kendall Square. Um, so let me go to the other side of, of Area 4, which is Central Square, where there are now no check cashing stores and four vegetarian restaurants. Um, if you were not in public housing, if, if Area 4 wasn't public housing, Area 4 would be completely gentrified at this point. Completely gentrified. The only thing that is keeping that affordable is the fact that it's owned by the city of Cambridge. I'm struck not only by your comment about the invisible wall, but by the fact that you can't grocery shop in Cambridge. It is astonishing that you cannot grocery shop in Cambridge. And there, I agree with you completely, Ron. There has to be some way that the, the enormous wealth that is being created in Kendall Square is spread around this city, and and I don't and what we're doing instead is encouraging this growth and supporting the growth and bending over backwards to get the growth, but not asking for the give back in the other direction. And so, what I'm hoping, what what have you seen in a public policy realm 
that forces these these organizations. I'm sorry, the Novartis lobby? Please. Nobody in this room will go into that Novartis group lobby, much less the people on your block. So what do you do to get to spread the wealth, essentially, around, around this city? Because it's getting more and more concentrated, and that campus, those walls are getting higher and higher and higher. I feel like we're all, we all asking each other really challenging questions, so I, I feel uh, protective of the audience because I feel like that's the big question that we're looking at is how can we break down the barriers, how can we deal with gentrification? I'm not sure if any of us have a good answer to that, um, but uh, thank you for the, the comment. Uh, hi, I've uh, lived in Cambridge for 10 years, uh, a reporter, and I've worked uh, here at Kendall around the block, around the corner for the same 10 years. Uh, and I'm just uh, continually astounded as this uh, as Kendall has grown more and more that there's no street level retail. And this is exactly uh, addresses what Deborah was saying, what everybody's really been saying, that you want sort of common spaces. The best common space that people actually use is not yet the lobby of some you know, lab building but actually diverse street level retail. Now we probably have enough restaurants to go around, so okay, we can stop building those. Um, but is there any idea or any plan to have retail in these big buildings that, are, that have been built and, are, and still are being built of a diverse nature? Maybe the East West Bookstore would like to uh, uh, move to Kendall. We're not planners, but we might be able to say where some of the places where we feel like we're able to meet and where we're gathering in Kendall Square. So maybe we can sort of respond to that question. Where are some of the places where you feel like you're able to gather with other people? What are some of the public meeting spaces, either interior or exterior, that you feel like are, are uh, gathering spots in the neighborhood? It's up in the Kendall Square. There are many. There are many. I, could, I can't name one. Yeah, I mean, I think just to, just to say, you know, for, for East Meets West Bookstore, for us, for example, I mean, um, it is just an extraordinary struggle to stay open. Like, it's an extraordinary, I mean, you know, my, my family has put in, I don't know how much money into that space just to keep it open. And, um, you know, it's, you don't make money creating spaces for, like, marginalized peoples to come share their stories. That's not, like, a profit. You know, you, you know what I mean? Like, there's no, there's no investors for that, right? So. Um, so, you know, my family's put in a huge amount of our own personal funds just to try to keep this space going. And, and it's not that there aren't folks that are supportive of these concepts and, and want to help, but, um, yeah, I mean, I think this, this, I think there's a, a pretty, it feels like a very shared frustration of kind of the lack of resources for real genuine um, kind of community building, right? Um, you know, one thing that strikes me, I mean, my personal kind of dream when, my, when I close my eyes and, and, you know, kind of imagine the world is like, yeah, there should be spaces like EMW or some version of it, you know, on like every street corner, right? You should have these really vibrant community spaces that, you know, young people feel safe to go into to explore their creativity and bond and build with each other. Um, and so, so yeah, I mean, I don't know the answer. I, I don't know what the answer is. And how do we, how do we kind of get the collective kind of grassroots power to make more of those spaces available? But I certainly agree with everybody that we need more of it. I, I was going to say, me, me too, to both of them. Uh, your comments. The one, the one thought I'd offer is that one of the reasons it was so easy for Kendall Square to take on this new incarnation is that so much of it had been zoned for uh, industry beforehand, which means you have large parcels, you don't have the expectation of a lot of retail, and so in that sense we've traded sort of that streetscape for this streetscape, and it's a lot easier to do that here than maybe around Central, where you have a lot more small buildings owned by more people, and as so down in Kendall, where you can buy a relatively large lot and put up a relatively large building, then you have a different economics if your company that's bought that lot. It's a statement of power to have an open lobby with flat stores and nothing there. Like a space is a rhetorical gesture. It's part of how the companies, the artists within the corporate architecture, like what it needs to be a successful you know, laboratory. And so we're also, that's a need as well. That may not be the need of pe that people in this room perceive, but in terms of how we get to where we are now and where we might go, that is one of the, the factors operating. I find myself with that one push back of kind of sort of like if, if the corporations can't afford 
community gathering space in a cafe on their first floor, but they can afford a big lobby on the ground level. It, it kind of goes to show what the, our role as stewards um, and that sense of responsibility to not only our profit sharing but, and to our employees, but also to the place we're inhabiting um, and building that conversation. And, um, you probably have a better sense of your campaigns going up there. Um, I'd like to thank the. Oh, hang on, there's somebody with the mic. Um, so I work at the MIT Museum, and so we're one of the places that's going into Kendall Square that maybe is a possibility for some of this community happening. But I wanted to reflect for a moment on a series of about a dozen interviews I did a year ago with uh, residents, longtime residents of the port in Area 4. And um, one of the questions I asked was, you know, their experiences on campus. And I can't tell you how many shared stories of sneaking in to play basketball at the Walker Memorial Gymnasium, um, that they roamed very specific corridors, that belly surfing on the granite floors was a really popular activity. And there was a Boy Scout troop in Building 20. And I could go on and on and list these things, but the spaces feel or felt in the 1960s and 70s in these descriptions much more porous. And I think if this is not a solution to inequity and you know all of the financial and economic disparities, but all of us as institutions could think about setting aside spaces and sponsoring how many Boy Scout or Girl Scout troops you know could you have here or senior programs or other activities embracing your space. It's not just arts, it's not just culture, it's not just theater, it's also just things like places to play basketball, tutoring programs, um, making it easier to move back and forth across those borders. So I, I feel like there's a lot to learn um, from people, you know, who are probably Ever, you know, in your generation, that experience of the um, uh, high school tutoring programs, the uh, upward bound programs, things like that, if we can make those much more visible, um, I think that would really uh, help. Uh, the question I always have about Kendall Square is, is it a, um, an office park or is it a neighborhood? And to me, it's much more of an office park because there are no <coughs> schools, there are no churches, there are no playgrounds, there are no children. Uh, so as we think about Kendall Square going forward, I think we really have to define which is. And, and uh, oh, I have one question. I only come to Kendall Square to go to events like this. <coughs> fabulous spaces that are made available to the public. Google, and I come occasionally to go to legal seafood, uh, and I come occasionally and I go to the Kendall Square Theater. But I'd be curious to know who, where people in the audience go in Kendall Square if not to work. Could you ask people? Um, yeah. So maybe we can. I want to make it a little more manageable because uh, we've got a lot of a lot of voices. So how many people come uh, to Kendall for things in the complex where the cinema is, the, those restaurants and the cinema? And then how many people come here to the train station and the plaza here by the, the train in Kendall Square? That's a good driver. And then how many people are coming here specifically to work or to study? Yeah. Like, is there, how many people come here for specific restaurants? Is there anything I haven't hit on that might be a category? Beer joints. That's so what we'll do. Beer joints. Beer joints. <laughs> like a mead hall of the artisanal oh. beers. There's a drop.
Uh, hi everybody, my name is Adam Haas. I'm an urban planning student at MIT. And everything that we're talking about is going to change very soon because of the Volpe rezoning, which is happening literally right now. Um, yesterday there was a four to five hour hearing on the site specific designs of what MIT is going to build at Volpe over the next decade. Um, and it's likely going to be finalized this week. Um, potential that it goes to the end of October, that's when the zoning petition expires. Um, but I would encourage everybody to engage with that process if you want to shape the future of Kendall Square. It's literally being decided this month um, of what that's going to look like for the next 10 to 15 years of development. Um, and the, the second thing is that there's an election on November 7th, and that also matters a lot of what is decided for the future of the city. So um, just I, I've been struck by how I could have rhetorical a lot of the comments have felt to me um, when I think we can play an active part in deciding what this place is. Um, thanks. I'd like to um, thank the Historic Society for putting this little booklet together with all of its historic photos in there. Um, and it's a good piece of work, but there's some gaps in the 1960s, I think, that are very important. 1962, the state and the federal government came in and said they wanted to build an inner belt through Cambridge. Eight lane roadway, 300 foot wide, um, through Cambridgeport, but in Area 4, they would have wiped out every house between Columbia Street and Elm Street. Just a whole swath coming down. The city unified in the period between 1965 and 1970. City Hall and the neighbors fought that road in unity, with help from MIT at the end. MIT played a very interesting role. No help from the city planners. They were in favor of the road. Okay. Um, 1967, the area of model cities was designated with an area four. They went all the way from basically um, uh, the, uh, um, from the railroad tracks almost up to Central Square. It was supposed to be a model city area for the 1960s for good planning for a citizen organization that is for us. And it was tough. It was a, a good idea, but getting everybody together and then fighting the highway was tricky. So um, I see that period of time as a wonderful period when City Hall and the residents were working together and not at cross purposes. Person being able to sort of ignore the residents the way they do today. So I think that's an important factor. Yes, Thank you. Um, so I actually moved to Cambridge very recently. I moved here about a year ago. Uh, and before then, I was living in New York, and before then, I was living in Canada, and before then, I was living in uh, Fuzhou uh, in China. And so one of the things that has always bothered me a lot about Cambridge is that it's not very discoverable in the sense that um, when people go someplace, they have a destination in mind. You know, we hop into our car and it's like, yeah, I'm going to work today and I'm going to drive by all of these wonderful little shops on the side uh, because, you know, I'm going at like a lot of miles per hour. Um, and I, on the other hand, commute by bike and I get to see a lot more of the cityscape that way. Um, so, you know, with the rise of bicycling as a way of commuting, do you guys see any uh, increases in like accidental discovery or porousness of the buildings? Um, and is there any plans for the cities to encourage that kind of commuting rather than in a car, barrier, barrier, barrier? I actually work for the City of Cambridge Department of Public Works, and I can tell you that the issue with the bicyclists and the motorists it is very, very controversial. <laughs> <laughs> they are at odds with one another, and right now we're finding that a lot of the businesses, because of the way the bike lanes now are being designed, where the bike lanes are going in, and cars are parking more out. A lot of the businesses are complaining because they're losing business. 
consumers are finding that it's very difficult to find parking because of these new bike lanes. So there, there's some problems there with it. I mean, I'm sure they'll work it out. I don't have a problem with it. And I'm sure the city will work it out. But right now, they're at odds with one another. There's, there are a lot of problems which have to be hashed out, and I'm sure they will. Uh, very briefly, uh, that's an interesting observation. And I want to bring it back to the discussion of some of the planning stuff. And my, I guess my, my main, one of my other sort of reasons I find the past an exciting way of talking about uh, the future is that the more you look at the past, the more that you see choices that were made. Uh, and certainly, like, you know, designing, designing a street to be good for automobiles was a result of choices that were made at one point. And, which is not to say that I know how to resolve the conflict between bikes and cars, which is definitely a, a high boil, but only that there's not any one way of, of doing that, and that you know, what changed once can, can change again. So depending on the types of pressure and the types of lifestyles that people want to live, you could see a different type of need for transit. But once again, like you know, the use of a car, and I want on the streets to be driving on that light move quickly to Cambridge. Uh, <laughs> but that's you know, a reflection of that people like having larger places to live, and they want lower density, and so they're willing to move farther away, and then you sort of, and it's hard to say if it's sort of a chicken and the egg thing, whether the technology allows you to move farther away, uh, or whether or not you want to move farther away, you sort of come up with the technology that allows you uh, to do it, but it's a very interesting observation. One thing I'm sort of struck by is, and part of our, our conversation for tonight is sort of thinking about Kendall Square into the future, um, and thinking about um, it wasn't it was not that long ago that Kendall Square was an industrial area and had big floor plans and and was more for factories um, and blue collar neighborhood, and now it's much more of a white collar and high tech building, high tech buildings with labs, with roads that are foremost built for cars and are trying to be adaptable. Thinking a little bit about how can we do a better job about um, thinking about the future as we go along and how things can be adaptable. So um, that sense of discoverability and like we're discovering um, the, the the space, but right now if it's there's uh, not much to discover in some ways in some of the spaces in, in the, the ground levels of Kendall Square, um, and how can we kind of slow things down and create open spaces. For sort of discover one another, discover the work that we're doing. Um, I, I don't have a solution to that, but I, I appreciate that. Sort of thinking. All right, um, so I'd like people to think about where they think Candle Square is and where it stops, all right? Now, a few years ago, uh, Deborah Do you mean remember, physically where Kendall Square stops? Excuse me? Do you mean physically where does Kendall Square stop? Where, uh, yes, and where, where is the border between Kendall Square and what isn't Kendall Square? And so, here's some background. A few years ago, uh, some folks were attending planning meetings the city was running, and they saw that there were, the planning department was depicting part of the development that we live in, Newtown Court, as being redeveloped as a mixed income project, and along Main Street, you had a completely different frontage with all kinds of little shops and so on in it. And then we saw that the maps that the city was putting out was saying that Lafayette Square, which is, you know where that is, it's where Main Street hits Mass Avenue, is a transitional district between Kendall Square and Central Square. And the next thing you know, everyone knows what Makerspace is. Have you heard of Makerspace? It's a good example of something good that an interrelationship between the tech, technological and, and you know, it's a little space in, 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 in Washington Elms, right next to Washington Elms, where uh, the youth can come and experiment with things like printing, printing stuff, you know, that, that you can use, that kind of stuff, 3D printing. But on the C Housing Authority website, it says that that's in Kendall Square. That's in Kendall Square. Now, I always thought of Kendall Square as being quite a long way away from us, but for purposes that have to do with real estate valuation, as far as I can see, they're saying that Kendall Square comes all the way up to the very edge of Central Square. Now that, you know, there's a conflict here. There's a conflict that can't be slid away. You can't compromise it away. There's a conflict between 
people who live around Central Square and who've lived here for a very long time and the expansion of the technological industry, people who, um, I hate to say this, people who may have gone to school for 20 years in Europe or Asia in order to become biotech uh, engineers and they come here and they find out that the rent is too high even if they start at 120000 a year, if they've got a, uh, a spouse and a kid, they can't pay the rent. They can't pay the rent. There's a, so there's a conflict that is, as long as Kendall Square just keeps expanding and without any limit, and there's no, no limit set to it, there's a conflict. And it's one that can't be, you can't take it away by saying, let's build spaces where everyone can mingle, because everyone ain't gonna mingle. That's, that's not the point. Mingling isn't the point. It's a conflict. And, I mean, there's no, there's not a, it's, I'm not giving a solution. I'm just raising an, an issue here that people want to avoid. They want to avoid the idea that there are conflicts that can't be completely eliminated by, by uh, something that will benefit both sides. That ain't, that's not happening. That's not happening. I'd like to say something, uh, make a couple of other observations, if you don't mind. If you could just, uh, it's because it has to do with the same thing. I look at banker and tradesman every week, and so I see who's buying property. And now about a third of the names generally are, are people, Chinese people are buying housing in Cambridge. But unlike uh, previous settlements, then there, there's not any place where people are settling in particular this, it's scattered all over the city. There's no community, there's no Chinese community developing, it's just people are all over the place. And I wonder, people think about uh, what's going to happen to the people who are moving in to be part of the biotech world. Are they ever going to form a community or are they people who are going to be moving on, coming and going? Okay. Actually, there's somebody right behind you. Yeah, one uh, population group that hasn't been mentioned at all is the people who live uh, just to the east of here in those uh, high rises that uh, are near the river. That's also part of our community. And uh, it just occurred to me that this huge building that's being built adjacent to this one on Ames Street, the, there's a, a vast amount of residential, which I believe is the upper stories of that building that's now under construction. So, are any of those people represented, or do they have a voice, or do they count at all? Do you have anybody that lives in those buildings? <laughs> I don't have answers, but I have a perspective. I came to Boston, the Boston area because of a postdoc, so I lived here since 2002. Yes, you have a hold the mic closer okay. and the I um, moved into Cambridge in 2009, and I was lucky enough to buy a, a loft in the 243 Penn Street Artists Association, which is, uh, I guess, the road is my neighbor to one side, the police station is down the corner. Um, so I have a background in the science, and I have a background now as an artist as well. Um, and from the perspective, the first question that was asked, why are people not coming out of those buildings and going to see what's happening in other areas of Cambridge? I would have to say it's time. When I was a scientist full time and in research, I was spending seven days a week working. Um, I had very little time to just hang out. Um, that's, that was my life and my passion. So people that are in the sciences, and most of the people in biotech are in the sciences, um, they don't have time. When you are in environments of research, and it's not, I'm not defending that by any means. Um, that sterile environment goes into the home as well. You like that kind of sterile environment. You, that's what you know. Um, when I left, I, I was very disappointed with science. I took, science. I took some time off a couple of years ago and I started exploring art. And um, then I discovered Central Square. I literally discovered Central Square. I just used to drive by Central Square. And now I know my neighborhoods very well. I sold my car and I walk everywhere. I have illustrated Cambridge, actually. <laughs> um, 
And so um, it's difficult to say, you know, I love Kendall Square. It's difficult for me to say what areas do people gather in. When I'm thinking of Kendall Square, I go by the river. A lot of people walk by the river. They love the walks by Memorial Drive. Um, when I want to eat something, I can go to the cafeterias by MIT. I, lunch is affordable. There are food trucks as well. Um, there are lots of restaurants. Um, for shopping, I go, I walk to Trader Joe's. So I love walking now. I walk everywhere. And everything is very close to where I live. Um, there are a lot of people that are moving into the tall buildings, as they say. Um, and they have kids. There are lots of young people moving into those areas. There's, there are a lot of young families around. I have seen the neighborhood changed a lot. Um, next to me is East Cambridge. I have everything in East Cambridge as well, six blocks away. Eight blocks away is, the, it, it is Somerville, but there's another supermarket. Um, if I want a pharmacy, there's CVS in the Galleria. So everything is close to me. I don't, I have a bicycle, but I basically like to walk. And um, I like walking everywhere and everything is close to me. That's, I love Cambridge. I love Cambridge and I love Kendall Square. <laughs> Um, hi, uh, thanks again for this sort of forum. Um, I've lived here now for over 25 years um, in the little pocket neighborhood over here in East Cambridge. I've seen a lot of changes and a lot of it's been really great to see what it was and, and to see some change, but what's been very disconcerting and disappointing to watch over the last 10, 15 years is that there is this real push and development in this Kendall Square area. And when I first moved here, um, there was only the Cambridge Brewery over in one Kendall. The movie theater wasn't there, and all those other restaurants. And so I've seen that grow and developed, and it's turned into a great place to go. I, I frequently go there and hang out, um, but I've also seen it down all at the end of Kendall Square, and I keep asking and wondering, why is there nothing for people who live here and have been here for years, like around 3rd Street, down 1st Street? Um, development, places to go, um, not like, I mean, there's development happening, like more building of biotech, high-tech buildings and office buildings, but the street level and the development <coughs> that could be there is just this pocket along the canal and those restaurants there and in Ma and, um, Main Street. And often they're closed, like you can't go there in evenings, weekends, because they cater to the certain group and business people that are here. So what bothers me is with all that is going on, what's happening to the community as a living 24-hour city for people of all ages and economic wealth that lives here that we just don't have. It's really getting catered to a certain group. And there's a lot of area that's, it's like you get off the Kendall Square T at night and you walk down Third Street, it's like it was 15, 20 years ago. It's dark. There's nothing there. So why not? I was struck by the, the speaker just before you who was talking about Kendall Square being a place to work. Um, and thinking back to the previous generations where Kendall Square was very much a, a place to work. Um, and that our, our expectations for uh, Kendall Square have shifted over the last generation in terms of uh, providing a lot more amenities and um, our, our, our bar has risen higher. So I've noticed you probably you've been taking notes of notes. Do you have some comments you might like to make? Sure, yeah. Uh, thank you to everyone, for once again, for sort of uh, telling your thoughts. Uh, this is very uh, interesting to me. And I, I mean, one thing I don't, I don't know, uh, even though I'm starting that, I sort of like to know, it would be wonderful to walk down you know, Main Street in 1930 and have a sense of what was happening then, like how did this place look, what the main activity was manufacturing, like, what type of street life existed, how did, you know, how permeable were the walls of those uh, factories, and that would be sort of interesting. I do know that, you know, of course, then there's sort of the, and I guess this is where I'm, I'm going to zoom back, because I'm fascinated to sort of how these things connect. So the fact that the industrial manufacturer in the Northeast uh, relocates largely on you know, 
there's a migration out of that to the second world war driven by the defense industry wanting to distribute stuff around the country in case the Russians attack, driven by labor unrest, driven, driven by aggressive development campaigns by cities in the Sun Gulf itself. You know, that sort of then, you know, that diminishes that neighborhood and then sort of prepares the, the canvas for this next uh, influx. And uh, then sort of how this broader set of decisions that were made about, you know, 20 years ago by especially pharmaceutical companies, like biotech expense, uh, that pharmaceutical companies are where the money are. Uh, but yes, they were making a decision about 20 years ago, like, are we going to go really develop in the Bay Area, around uh, Stanford and UC Berkeley, or are we going to come to Cambridge? And which of those do we think is going to be sort of the most promising site? And they, by and large, uh, not to be, they, they chose Cambridge uh, for a number of reasons, and that really has been the, the second crank on sort of the biotech wheel, and that's the wheel that draws in people who serve as postdocs and then migrate to, to companies, and then these are you know, workers who are highly talented, who are being paid uh, very well, and then they're trying to live their, their life in there you know, because you know, space is finite and you know, the, the market is determining rents. You get, these, you get these streetscapes that can pop up, you know, a streetscape that's not a 24 7 uh, streetscape, a streetscape that's really long on really great food and things that generally young people like to do, or people not, not young people, like people between, say, 18 and 45. That because those are the people who are coming in who have also are young and don't necessarily have families yet, so they've got a ton of disposable cash. But, but then the but then most are also working incredibly hard. They don't really have a lot of time to get out because of the rhythms of what they're doing. And so they want to just go wake up in the morning and go to work. And they want to get out of work, they maybe want to get a beer or something close by and they want to you know, come home. And so I can and, but that's all sort of as from my perspective, I see that as being sort of nested within these much broader uh, transitions, and so we're seeing all of those things are present as we walk down Kendall Square at you know 8 p.m. on a Tuesday, and we wonder why all the you know, why all the storefronts happen to be dark. Uh, so sorry, that's what I've been scribbling. I just wanted to add something about the attraction of uh, the Kendall Square area to a lot of corporations and businesses. The city of Cambridge has been known as the Republic of Cambridge. This city has always been extremely diverse. This city has always opened its arms to people of any ethnic group, race, religion, sexual preferences. This is a city that actually really doesn't have a lot of prejudices. And I'm speaking on this from experience. As I said, my family has been here. My family came here from the Caribbean islands back in 1904 have been here for many years, and we've never really experienced or had a lot of problems with racial discrimination. My entire life living here, I'm 60 years old, this has always been a very friendly, open city, and I have found that some of these corporations specifically chose this city because of its diversity and the fact that the people in this city get along with one another. You asked at the beginning of uh, anyone get punched a time clock. Um, I did punch a time clock on Ames Street. In four years that I was in college, I worked for a company called United Car Fastener. And the fourth generation of the American American. My great grandfather owned a home over near the Kendall Square Cinema, and he was a teamster. My dad was a Cambridge police officer. His beat began at Wolf and Smith Pharmacy, right in Kendall Square, and his beat went up Main Street, so his beat was Jefferson Park. We heard about the projects. I grew up on a street off Concord Avenue. It was integrated. I was very, very blessed as a young child. We would come to Kendall Square every Christmas and go to the high figure skating company and come home with a new pair of ice skates. And as I said, when I grew up, I got a job working the four years of college, pressing a time clock at a manufacturing company that produced car knobs and sent them off to Detroit to make cars. I guess the point I want to make um, is that if my dad, who didn't graduate from college, hadn't had an opportunity to become a police officer in Cambridge, and I hadn't had the opportunity to go to college in Cambridge, where I first saw 
that the inequity wasn't about racial issues, but about economic issues. That's the divide that needs to be conquered. So for the people in that neighborhood, we have the wall is they need jobs, and there are service jobs in Kendall Square. They're not going to come in and be scientists right away, but there are jobs that could be had, and then maybe their children would have the opportunity that I did to go to college, to be blessed, to have a good career. And those are the points that I wanted to make. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a suggestion, which is that the Cambridge uh, Historical Society perhaps get in touch with the Department of Urban Studies and Planning at MIT to propose that there be a studio focused on civic engagement that would involve, let's say, Area 4 and everything around it. And through the studio, begin to figure out what are the ways to overcome, to get rid of that wall, or at least to start breaking it down uh, that would not be just a one-shot deal, but something that would last and that would be carried on. Uh, you know, uh, DUSP is one of the best, of maybe not the best uh, in the country, and it's right here. And take a look at your home, and, and, and the studio, as I said, focused on civic engagement. What does that mean? Who comprises it? Who is being engaged? And what does civic space look like? and what could it look like, and how do people behave in that space, et cetera, et cetera. I think there was somebody here from Dusk, okay, take it back. I have a question for Robert. Uh, you you, you uh, mentioned that the uh, uh, life science companies decided to come to Cambridge instead of Silicon Valley. And beyond uh, the universities, um, here, what made them decide to come here? And do you can you give us a sense how many jobs were created through these companies in the last 10, 15 years, just to get a sense of the growth of this uh, this phenomenon? I uh, let's see. Uh, yes, I think the the first iteration of this actually goes back to something we talked about on the first uh, panel. In, which was in 19, the mid-1970s when uh, recombinant DNA was developed as a technology. It was first, I mean, one of the things that makes the biotech industry so exciting is that you can change something at the molecular level and produce this tremendous effect. You don't need to build a whole factory or purify insulin. You can get an E. coli bacteria cranking it out for you in a, a fermentation vat. That's the exciting thing, that the recombinant DNA was the first technology that suggested we could do that. People had a lot of concerns about its uh, safety. Uh, and a number of cities near universities where you had scientists who worked with the technology were very wary about having biotech companies established using that technique. There were restrictions. Uh, they wanted you to work on bio warfare facilities, essentially. Uh, very expensive. You're not going to hard to operate a company that way. Uh, Cambridge had a big debate and passed something called the recombinant DNA uh, ordinance, which was very contentious. And, the only thing I'll say there is that from a regulatory perspective, business historians that I've read say that was the first part. That's why Biogen, Gen, uh, Biogen was able to set up along with a number of other companies who sort of prepared uh, the ground and that sort of flagged Cambridge as a place where you could run a biotech company. And you know, industries tend to cluster because you need the same lawyers, you need you know, people like switching jobs, people like talking to each other, especially in biotech where that type of uh, technological flux is uh, happening all the time. Uh, then the thing I think that was decisive in the early 2000s uh, was the fact that uh, there was such a close, at least what I've read once again, sort of the, the business press, is not only did you have uh, MIT was cranking out a lot of people who are skilled in these areas and attracting the best international talent uh, to study there that could then be recruited. Uh, MIT is also very friendly to that. They've always liked to get their technological institute. They like working with industry. And of course, they had a lot of strength being computed. And people thought that informatics was also going to somehow merge with biotech. Uh, that was another promising thing. And so that's sort of the very uh, you know, thumbnail sketch. In terms of how many jobs have been produced, I'm afraid that my history doesn't extend that far forward. It's certainly a lot. I, I think a raw number is like the amount of laboratory space in terms of square footage, which maybe you know, proxies increased, I think, at least five times, if not more. And, that's maybe the sure biggest indicator. And of course, MIT is building a lot more because it sees a, a virtuous cycle between encouraging companies to come and then renting out buildings, the lab space that it has, and it gets revenue, which you can then use to sponsor 
more scientific research, which will produce more spin-off companies, which will attract more companies, you sort of see uh, how that goes. But, so it's definitely not, not impact in terms of the absolute number of jobs. Uh, you have to say that my best uh, decision is to invest in this. Uh, you're not. <laughs> I do not know. Uh, but just to piggyback on your point really quickly, uh, so uh, the Cambridge Health Department, uh, Sam Lipson, who's over in the Cambridge Health, Par Health Department, actually wrote a paper, which is on the website there, that specifically talked about that point, and specifically about the regulatory story, and about how the fact that a lot of early biotech companies, after those, those ordinances were passed, you know, sort of a question of, like, do I want to go someplace where I don't know what the rules are going to be, or do I want to go someplace where, you know, yes, there's a lot of incredible intellectual capital with, you know, lines of and so on, uh, but, you know, where there are going to be some rules that we do know what they are going to be. So I think that was a, a very big part of, of uh, that early story. Uh, and just, I just wanted to comment, you know, I, I didn't really know exactly what to expect with this panel and kind of what we're going to talk about today, but uh, I feel like this is kind of, uh, you know, kind of transformed into like almost like a, you know, town hall, like we're all, you know, everybody just really expressing, you know, how they care about Cambridge and what's, what's uh, moving forward. So I just wanted to express my appreciation for everybody uh, for, for that. And I wish there were like city council or whoever else was here for this because this is you know, kind of turned into a really uh, a very powerful moment for me to experience uh, everybody's stories. So just thank you all for sharing. Hey guys, it's Baruth. Um, so I find myself in this weird position of maybe having to defend some biotech companies. Um, uh, and it's been a really interesting journey for me as we've worked at the society over the course of the year to think about biotech and Kendall, which is the area I have no experience in. Um, but the more we talk to these companies, uh, the more we learn about the life-saving work that they're doing and when, I, when I've talked to them, and trust me, I am someone who wants more money out of biotech um, as someone who runs a nonprofit here in Cambridge, um, but to hear them talk about the great work they're doing and what they're doing to change the world, I mean, it, it is inspiring. We've gone behind the scenes at El Nilo, which was a really great company, so kind to us, took us through their lab, and it was eye-opening. So, um, I guess I, I'd like to ask the panelists, especially Deborah and David, who grew up here in Cambridge, how do you feel about Kendall? What is your primary emotion? Um, because I think for many of us, it might be, you know, I've heard a lot of feelings tonight, right? A lot of distrust and um, mystery and uncertainty, but um, I, as someone who runs a historical society for a very, very important city in America, I want us all to feel pride, especially about what's happening in Kendall. And I'm wondering if you guys will ever get there, or if you're there. Um, maybe you entered late and you missed what I said earlier. But what I had mentioned earlier is that progress is wonderful, and I'm certain that most of the cures to a lot of the diseases that affect people around the world are going to come out of Kendall Square. But when it comes at the expense of people being displaced in generations, you know, people whose families have been here for hundreds of years, and they can't afford to pay rent to live here anymore, they can't buy a home here, then it's not fair. It's not fair. You're going to just completely boot these people out of the city of Cambridge, whose, whose families have been here for hundreds of years. There's got to be a way to work it out. It just has to be. It's just not right. That's my feeling. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's you know, I, like, I, I personally am totally an optimist at heart. Like, I, I really genuinely believe, you know, despite all the madness going on out there, you know, I when I look around at the communities that I work with, you know, at EMW, at the Media Lab, at MIT, I'm, I only see amazing, like caring, compassionate people that really, really want to make the world a better place. Like I think this whole room is full of people that really, really concern, have concern and compassion in their hearts. So, um, you know, on that kind of community level, like, I feel like Cambridge is an incredibly inspiring place. Like, I'm, I'm incredibly inspired by so many folks um, that, that I get the great privilege of working with every single day. Um, and what you were saying before about, you know, Cambridge being such a diverse place and a welcoming place, you know, I agree 100%. Um, it's, um, so, you know, I think it's, it's, you know, these stories are always complicated, right? It's never just a simple narrative that, like, you know, everything is awesome or everything is terrible. Um, I think there's, so there's kind of different levels that you have to kind of think about. 
Um, you know, I personally am, am always, of course, aware of what's happening in the world and aware of kind of these different levels, but I, I really focus personally on the kind of human level interaction of who I get to connect with and build with every day. I mean, that is the communities that I'm a part of here in Cambridge, and, and yeah, I'm just hyper-optimistic about, about kind of where we're going to go, and, and I think that there is, um, you know, a tremendous amount for us to be, uh, be excited about, both from the kind of technology level and stuff that's going to be getting created, but I think also just the, the people that are, are kind of moving through different institutions in Cambridge and experiencing kind of those benefits of, of uh, you know, the education, the different community programs, and so on. So, um, so yeah, I, I, uh, I feel good. I feel great about, about kind of where we are. And obviously, there's always more work to do, but, but I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic. That seems like a really nice place to end it. <laughs> <laughs> Did my job for me, but maybe wondering if you had any last questions. I want to say no more last questions. Um, I think mostly I just want to thank everyone for their kind of open-hearted conversation that they had here tonight. Um, and thank you for sort of standing up for biotech. I think some of the challenges, especially in terms of displacement, are things that every community in Greater Boston and in cities across the country is dealing with. Um, and Cambridge is lucky enough that there's some balancing of the scales in terms of having amazing, life-changing um, uh, discoveries happening here, uh, corporations that are willing to, to think in a forward way in terms of engaging with the community and making some of their resources known and, and continuing those kind of conversations as part of, sort of building the bridges. So I want to thank the Cambridge Historical Society for fostering the conversation about this and helping to build bridges not only within this room but within the kind of greater community.